I like having a band. You know, we have our own theme tune. Um, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Um, there were supposed to be five of us. Um, unfortunately, one person couldn't make it. We attempted to replace him with an AI, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the technology is not that far down the line yet. Um, Europe, as I'm sure you all know, has become something of a fintech hub over the last sort of 10 years. We've got some real kind of significant global companies now coming out of Europe, Adyen in the Netherlands, uh, in Amsterdam, um, Klarna in Stockholm, TransferWise coming uh, out of um, London. And what's interesting is that uh, I curate a conference uh, in London every year, Wire of Money, and what people really want to talk about over the last couple of years is how AI is affecting fintech and how uh, that's going to move things forward in the next few years, uh, whether that's payments, whether that's investment, or whether that's uh, other kind of financial services. Um, fortunately, we have three people here today with deep expertise in this area who are, I'm interested uh, to hear their thoughts on, on how things and where we are and where we're moving on to. Um, so maybe first, um, gentlemen, if you don't mind just quickly introducing yourself, giving uh, the audience a sense of... Uh, uh, what you do and, and, and your kind of uh, uh, involvement in this space. So, so maybe Alex, you'd like to start. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Alexander Del Toro Barba. I'm a head of product and marketing at Visual Vest. That's a robo advisor, so wealth management uh, digitally. Um, and we are um, trying to find out what we can do next in that stage. So, uh, machine learning and um, artificial intelligence is one of the big topics that we are exploring at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you. So my name is Jan Yogrande, I'm EVP for mobile services, a company called Wirecard. Wirecard is a payment and banking technology company. We provide services for number 26 Curve. We are a strategic partner of Vodafone and Orange, and we are doing a cooperation with Alipay. So we are involved in every payment, uh, in, if it's e-commerce or retail, and we see a lot of uh, AI um, development in this space. Uh, that's quite interesting for us. Okay, great. Thank you. Jürgen. My name is uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber. Uh, for many decades, I have been working on building an artificial intelligence, which is smarter than myself, such a, that I can retire. <laughs> and um, and uh, at the moment, I'm scientific director of the Swiss uh, Artificial Intelligence Lab in Lugano, and also um, president and co-founder of Nascence, which is a company which is trying to build the first real practical artificial intelligence that quickly learns one thing after another. And one of the use cases is financial prediction, and that's the reason why I'm sitting here. Great, thank you, uh, guys. So first question, I think it would be interesting to get a sense of, of the state of play at the moment. Obviously, there's huge excitement uh, about AI in terms of kind of um, uh, speech recognition, image recognition, um, those kind of areas, fraud detection. Um, where are we right now, Alex? How is it being used, particularly with, with reference to FinTech? Okay, um, well, in uh, banking and finance in general, uh, machine learning is not, not a new topic. That's at least since the 80s, you can correct me. Um, but uh, during the last years, we, we have on the one side um, more computing power at less cost, yep. and more data are digitally available. So that provides a huge opportunity to, to really make, make a dent in the universe with these modern techniques and provide uh, solutions that, that help the, the banks yep. and the customers. Um, to, to make to be more convenient, so you see that in uh, in fraud assessment, in uh, risk management, uh, in the back end, we also see that in portfolio management, um, uh, wealth management, that what uh, Mr. Schmidhuber is also doing, um, and in the front end, we have this whole uh, what we have now, the popularity with chatbots or virtual assistants, yeah. um, where you need somebody who is not only working on a simple lookup table. You ask a question, they check what's the answer, but a virtual assistant who's really, um, with sentiment analysis, really understands you and you can, you can give free answers and they, they really help you with advices. The only thing what is uh, interesting in the future is these fintechs, they're normally, or most of them are very narrow in their solution. Yeah. Um, so we see a trend at the moment at the market that most of them are working together with big banks because banks have normally the infrastructure and they have the data to do that. Um, the things that are very interesting is um, that customers who are on the front end and the customers at the end, the most important um, sure. goal, um, they actually demand more convenience, which would a chatbot uh, fulfill, and they also demand more individualization. 
in, okay. in the offers. And that's something machine learning can provide in a back end. So increasing that individualization. Jorn, how are you using it in your, your, your business? How, how, would, how would consumers um, recognize so, it? So far, like. Alexander said fraud and risk potential uh, yeah. is, is, is a topic where machine learning uh, logic is something that is uh, widely used, so scoring of customers. On, on the other hand, what we see is a lot of more and more invisible payments, like this Uber experience. You, you, you call an Uber and there is no actually payment process. Everything is done in the back end. That's yeah. something uh, Google, for, uh, for, for instance, is trying in a retail situation in uh, the Bay Area where you simply walk in the store. Um, give the clerk the, your goods and say, I pay with Google. And this is uh, working via a Wi-Fi tracking beacon technology and face recognition. And these kind of technologies are getting much, much stronger. We see a lot of um, startups, Safe here in Munich is one um, that has developed something like Selfie Pay. Um, so instead of uh, authentication with your card, you simply use your face. And there is a lot of uh, machine learning uh, in this because I think the the, the way the biometric uh, processes were working in the past were having a photo of your face and then having some measurements, really, that are fixed. But now, um, the machine learning logic is trying to understand more what is your facial identity, something that we, as, as men, really do. We, even if you change a lot, uh, we can identify you. And this okay. is something that the system is trying to. So um, we see this in, in these kind of areas is huge interest. And, 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 but it's just about to start. I have to say, Google is just having a, a trial. SK Telecom is in Korea is, is trying this. So there is a lot of um, development, but we are not in a state yet um, on this retail situation that we are speaking of a commercial uh, global launch or something like this. So I, think, I think that touches on a point, um, and maybe Jürgen, you can answer this. Um, it touches on the point that machine learning, AI, we don't really know to some extent what the possibilities are because it's about trying things out. It's about experimentation. It's about finding solutions that we might not even imagine at the moment. Is, 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 that, is that the case, do you think? Yeah. So all of machine learning is about um, improving the system from a state where it doesn't know much to a state where it knows a lot about a certain domain. And on the way there, it makes errors and then over time it learns to reduce the errors. And um, what we see in recent years is a resurgence of artificial neural networks, uh, sometimes rebranded under, under the name deep learning. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of deep learning. It's just networks with many stages or recurrent networks that can deal with sequences, which are a little bit inspired by the human brain. And they are similar to the extent that they also learn by changing the connections between the neurons in a way that is at least um, a little bit similar to what babies apparently do as they learn from scratch to understand how the world works and then use that knowledge to achieve goals. And machine learning in many ways is trying to do the same thing. So there's a comparison there to the human brain. Um, presumably, though, what the, the place that we're in right now, if I could just follow that up, is, and, and guys, please jump in, is that we, we're kind of training these things rather than actually programming and controlling them. Is that, yeah. is that too simplistic, or is that the case? That's the case. So for example, you would can uh, train a system like that to drive a self-driving car. How yeah. does that work? In comes video and um, out go steering signals, braking, accelerating, and so on. And then in the beginning, the neural network is just a, a general purpose computer in between, between these inputs and the outputs. But um, it doesn't have a program uh, which really works uh, because all these connections that tell each neuron how ma much am I influenced from this by this other neuron at this moment in time, they are all random. It knows nothing. But then you show him, you show the network how it works, and you give it examples of good driving. And then from there, it can pick up what is important in the incoming video and um, how to react uh, in certain situations. And it learns to become a driver as well. Yeah. So it's, they're learning rather than we're teaching them. Is, 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 that, is, is that the case? Like we're, we're increasingly just finding that they are figuring out sort of solutions um, in, in their own terms. Is, 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 would you recognize that, Alex? I'm not, I'm not a specialist like Jürgen in uh, artificial intelligence, but uh, what, what we take from it and what is very important, it's not an algorithm where we can see from the beginning what the machine will do at the end. Okay. The machine will have to learn 
uh, on itself uh, and improve the performance over time. Yeah. And that's something that's very important in, in many areas. From a, from a robber advisor perspective, we can see that um, f in wealth management in the back end, we have quants um, and machine learning technologies, they can really support them to take a lot of workload away so that they get more free time to creative uh, okay. stuff. And machines can learn over time and improve the performance. Um, that's something that many banks also are already heavily investing in. And in the front end, it's also that, uh, that uh, when, they, when they talk to a machine, that um, they can understand what is the actual problem of the, the, the user yeah. and can uh, provide him, uh, for example, a portfolio that, that suits to him or in other banking areas, a, a current account that helps them to manage their finances better. I, I call that the democratization of finances because um, more sophisticated wealth management uh, technologies or, or algorithms that were before only available to very high income people are through machine learning and the standardization right. available to the middle class. And uh, for, for lower income people, um, a virtual assistant that helps them, that understands the situation and helps them over time to improve um, how to manage their finances, to save something. Um, that's also a very big benefit that uh, banks at the moment simply cannot do to that extent because it's a very individual um, management. Okay. So in terms of the next sort of five or ten years, and uh, anyone please jump in on this, D do you see increasingly kind of, you know, Quants and bankers being, you know, people who are, you know, advising people on their portfolios, on their investment strategy. Are, are those people going to, uh, are their jobs going to be threatened in any way, or will they just their roles be different to, to how they are now? Is that is? We are not going to replace all of them, but um, certainly we are going to redefine what they are doing in many ways yeah. because the methods that they used to use to predict stock market data and stuff like that. Um, have become better and there are new methods which go beyond what you were able to do with the previous methods and, um, and that's the reason why the most suc successful outfits will, um, will profit from these rather new developments in a way that makes them even more profitable and in the end um, those will remain obviously. Yeah. Your, your, your company that you're developing that's going to use AI uh, in order to, to uh, provoke efficiencies in the marketplace. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? How, why is that going to be better than a human being? Mm. Why will machines do that in a superior way? So um, artificial neural networks is a theme which goes back at least to the 50s and 60s. And uh, back then there was a, a guy from the Ukraine who is the father of deep learning, which is about deep neural networks with many subsequent computational stages. But since then, a lot of uh, a lot has happened and so in the 90s uh, we were able to for the first time um, deal with um, very deep learning systems uh, which can learn to deal with long sequences of data such as stock market data for example or speech uh, so maybe you don't know it but uh, most of you have a piece of us in uh, your pocket um, that's your smartphone and if you if you don't type into that but if you dictate something to that then it has to do speech recognition and in 2015 speech recognition of Google Voice became much better because they started using this long short-term memory network that we developed since the 1990s and which has become more or less um, state-of-the-art in this field uh, around, two, mm, around 2008, around that year. What is happening there, there's a, a network which is a little bit like uh, the brain. Uh, in the sense that you have all these neurons in your brain, you have got about 10 um, billion neurons in, in the cortex, and each of them is connected to 10,000 other neurons, and um, some of them are input neurons, and some of them are output neurons, and over time they change the connection strengths in a way that makes them solve problems better, problems such as speech recognition. So. When speech recognition uh, occurs, then you get about uh, 100 new input vectors, uh, number vectors coming in per second, and um, the network memorizes what happened before. It has learned to ignore the unimportant stuff, but to uh, memorize the important stuff and uses that then later to make better predictions. Uh, predictions about what does that mean, or if you apply the same thing to the stock market, uh, then uh, you can use it to predict financial indicators and stuff like that. Now, the big thing, the, the main driver of the commercial success of these methods in recent years is the fact that every five years, computers are getting fa uh, faster by a factor of 10 for the same price. 
And this trend has held much longer than Moore's law, which has broken. <laughs> Moore's law is about um, the number of transistors that you can squeeze into a chip, and also has held uh, for a long time. So for many years, uh, it was true that every 18 months, you can squeeze twice as many transistors on the chip. However, there's this even older law, which has held at least since 1941, when uh, Konrad Zuse built the first working program controlled computer um, in Berlin. And since then, every five years, a factor of 10 means we have now uh, 75 years, um, which means it's a factor of 10 to the 15, or a million billion. So a million uh, billion times more uh, computing power for the same price. And this, for the first time, is close to what the human brain can do. A human brain can do a little bit more than that. Probably, we don't know exactly, but um, there are reasonable estimates. And if the trend doesn't break, then um, in the very uh, near future, we will really have small devices, like a cell phone or something, which can compute as much as a human brain. And then, 50 years later, if the trend doesn't break, and there's no obvious reason why it should break, then for the first time you will have for the same price, for a thousand euros or something like that, a small device which can compute as much as all 10 billion human brains of all humankind together. And there will not only be one such device, there will be many, many, many. And everything is going to change. And every profession is going to affect it, be affected, not only fintech, but every single profession that you can imagine. And there is a new thing happening, which is not just another industrial revolution, but which goes beyond that, which goes beyond humankind even, which is maybe comparable to the invention of life 3.5 billion years ago. <laughs> a new thing is happening that transcends humanity. And one little use case of that is financial applications that we are discussing here. Yeah. Well, let's talk payments then. <laughs> um, uh, oh my god. <laughs> Um, your, um, the, the, the computing power is expanding enormously. Obviously, the network with the Internet of Things coming online very soon is going to expand enormously. There are going to be so many more kind of uh, vulnerabilities. There's going to be so many more kind of uh, you know just, just data points. Um, how do you think payments is going to change in that time where pretty much everything that we want to be uh, connected to the network can be connected to the network? I think first. It sounds a bit crazy for us. It's a matter of speed. So um, the, the classic authentication methods, for uh, to say so, um, are, are, are not really real time. If you take a look at Apple Pay in uh, Transport for London, for instance, there you have a Touch ID, so um, you have the fingerprint, and a lot of people are in a tra travel and transport situation. Like two or three seconds are a lot. People are standing behind you and stuff like this. So the question is, could I? Learn a bit about the uh, about the user um, by his phone usage. So, um, can I identify him before the transaction is actually happening? So, his gestures, his t his his way to uh, use the keyboard, yep. his language is really identifying a person very very clearly in in in, in the system. And to use this kind of thing is, uh, I think, a very intelligent uh, thing because in the 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 classic ways of of identifying a customer. Um, are a bit too slow. So we have one startup, uh, it's called Nimi in, in, in Canada, that is measuring the cardiac rhythm. So it's not the heartbeat, it's the rhythm that is behind of the heartbeat. And with this kind of stuff, they identify you clearly in the system. And this is what payment is, is all about, to really know who's actually in the situation to do the payment transaction. Yeah. And this will be in a situation where, the inter where you're an in internet of things, you need to be identified clearly in the system to use the services you're up to. And this is uh, the thing that we are seeing. Um, it's an evolution in identifying from customers. And we, we do this with different data points made by biometrical, ha habitual stuff, and, and the way you use an infrastructure. So if I understand this right, it's, it's almost like we'll be authenticated to go onto the network to use the network, and yeah. we'll always be connected exactly. and authenticated. Yeah. So because we'll... these things have to happen very, very fast. And um, in the situation, you know, you step in in a car, you do a, you, you want to start a, a service or something like this. It's, I think, it's too late for um, having like a password or a, uh, type in a PIN. Yeah. Or these kind of methods are vulnerable, as history is showing. So there's a lot of fraud based on passwords. So I think this kind of area where you have like uh, um, eight-digit passwords, they might be gone in the next future, and you will using much more biometric patterns and other uh, right. authentication so we'll be methods. Identified through our biometrics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Alex, you want to jump in on that yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah. When, you, when you look at these uh, solutions, uh, Jürgen and Jörn explained, then you see that um, the, 
the biggest players in that market are tech companies. You have Baidu in China, uh, Google, Facebook. Um, what does that mean for banks in five or ten years, yeah. when the technology, technological platform and the research is done by, by um, other companies that are in complete different sectors? And uh, the question is here, for example, um, if the user want to be convenient, uh, want to have convenience, and uh, let's say there's a messenger like Facebook, um, what's the position of a banking service then? Is it, is it merely a service, a feature integrated there between all the others? Um, will um, will you still talk to a chatbot in finance, or will my messenger talk to another chatbot when I talk to it? So the chatbot talk to each other and give to me the solution, which means that the banks will will, will go far in the back end, yeah. and at the end of the day, uh, banks will need to ask themselves when you look into five or ten years, um, uh, will this build still relevant in the front? Or will there be only a service in the back end? Do you see kind of banks almost taking on the role of being almost like the Amazon Web Services rather than the kind of the front end, the user you, interface? You have Alexa. Uh, you have Alexa that uh, can listen to you all the time. They can, uh, and that's all about machine learning. It's about data, so they can improve. That's what bank, banks can only do with the current account. They can listen to you, and you talk to Alexa. Um, do you are, still need to talk to a bank? Or do you talk to Alexa and ask them what to do, and they do the, the same in the back end, which means there is no bank in, in the front end. But we have also, and that's another thing that, that is not uh, quite sure yet, um, since we are still humans, um, there is the tendency that we don't ask one virtual assistant for everything. We normally have this trust that there is a banking specialist for the one thing, and uh, there is a media specialist for another one. Yeah. And uh, some research has told us also that um, even within banks, many people like to have a conservative view and a more aggressive view. So when you ask, what should you do, then actually it's good for an end customer that two chatbots are discussing two different perspectives right. to lead the user into the right um, decision. Um, and that would lead, is there only one chatbot in the future that is economically a, a big issue, not only for banks, because it means there is a doorkeeper, or uh, will he just give you, uh, contact you to another one, and then you can talk to different chatbots who, who give you an advice. And that's not clear yet, but banks definitely need to figure that out and um, need to test. And that's what we talked before, to just to try it out, to test what's going on, what uh, users might like or what might not. But you need to go in the market and try out. Otherwise, the technolo technological platforms will take over the market. And this feeds into the whole notion of bank services being unbundled and disrupted by sort of smarter, leaner um, startups that can provide uh, a better user interface, a better customer experience. And banks are increasingly going to be kind of running s sort of uh, infrastructure in the background rather than being at, at the front end. Is that something you'd recognize you on? As, as, as we're a technology partner of a bank like number 26, I think uh, we, we totally see this. So we're living, first of all, we're living in an RP driven world. So um, the banks don't have to really have a banking license to do um, their stuff. And in the early days, especially in Germany, it was all about branches and, and services. Uh, but now there is a potential, really, with these new technologies to act as a bank and, 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 um, uh, and really compete against banks like Deutsche Bank um, via new technologies. And this is what we see in e-com also. There's a lot of talk about in the e-commerce field about general user interfaces. So um, theory is that we only use three to four applications there, like WhatsApp, Facebook, and stuff like this. So everything is being channeled through this application. So the messaging apps. The messaging apps okay. and stuff like this. And this is uh, something that a lot of people see coming, that the, 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 the internet, the e-commerce websites go to the background, and people do the ordering, do the, the, the communication uh, with the brands or the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the retailers uh, through um, a general user interface like WhatsApp or Slack or Facebook. Yeah. And um, yeah, this has some benefits because these general user interfaces have a lot more data than an e-commerce. You see a lot more what the guy is typing, how he's typing, uh, what kind of, of media is he using. Um, and this has some risk because, I mean, if there was a central gateway for all communication, for all uh, commerce, um, it could, might be vulnerable. So um, there are two, two sides, I would say. And for finances, that, sorry, for sure. finances, that also means that um, when banks think about how, how would they go for the next years, that it's not necessary or it is not sufficient anymore to build a, an app. 
app is almost over. That's yeah. like 65% uh, in the US download zero apps per month because they have everything they need. Um, and what they like to have it more convenient is to have one app where they do everything inside. Um, so when, an, when a bank or financial provider thinks, how can we go into the new generation more digitalized, um, apps are like the basic premise. That's something you need to start anyways, but that's not the future. That's, you need to start look for corporations. So, so, so give, give us an idea of if, 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 if applications are becoming less and less important, like how will people uh, run their kind of their banking services um, through through messaging apps or, or through other kind of portals that are are, 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 are are systems where they can maybe book a car, they can uh, check up on a flight, they can do you know customer service or whatever. How, what would that look like? That experience feel like for you, people? You see, you see two different trends at the moment. It's not clear if they will be successful, but the one is that single applications on mobile phones will become like umbrella apps, like WeChat in China. That's the most um, sure. famous example. That's within the operating system, one app that tries to uh, take everything over uh, because it's convenient for the customer, like Jörn said. The other thing is that what Google and Apple are uh, trying at the moment to bring that back to, to the operating system um, so that they put a virtual assistant or a messenger app in front so that take that market over. I don't think that there will be a monopoly in the future because um, people tend to, they want to have convenience, but they also don't want everything in one provider. You still use iOS, but you use WhatsApp and not the, the message all the time. So um, humans still don't want everything in one. Um, so that's why I don't think that you will have one only umbrella app, but you will have a st much stronger concentration on only a very few providers because it's convenient. Okay. So, Jürgen, um, talking big picture again and sort of like predictive um, notions, um, I read a couple of years ago about a a uh, Japanese bank that had appointed, now this, this might sound a little bit gimmicky, but that they had appointed an AI to the board, and that AI had a vote on the board. Um, do you see that kind of uh, sort of changing of the roles in boardrooms of, of, of executive groups um, to be less now about uh, looking at uh, quarterly reports, so performance data that's historic, and more about making bets on what's coming next by whatever, by scraping data from across the open web. Is that something that you, you see? Yeah, so first of all, I see the value of that stunt uh, of having an AI on the board as a PR um, yeah. gag, as a marketing gag. Um, that's um, worth a lot by itself. I'm not sure how many millions that by itself was worth. However, um, generally speaking, um, you will have more and more AI-based decision makers um, coming in. And um, this is true both for the big companies, but also for the little guys who are wearing them in their pockets. And uh, like what you said, that there is this trend towards having one single app that controls all the others, and um, such that you only have to speak to your phone, and it understands you better, and understands better your gestures and everything, and knows better what you would like to have as a service next such that it can uh, make good suggestions of what should be done next and so on. So the general trend is certainly to have this little fr friend in your pocket which becomes m smarter and smarter and uh, becomes a, uh, a friend that makes you more and more addicted to him, even more than you are addicted today to your cell phones because it understands better what you want and then uh, your financial needs um, are different for each person, of course, but then uh, it learns about your particular financial needs and then helps you to um, um, make decisions by suggesting stuff, which, um, which then many customers will just accept um, without thinking too much about it, to the extent that this app has a reputation as being a good decision maker. So um, those companies who are able to come up with uh, smart assistants like that, they will profit a lot. So what I'm trying to say is it's not only going to be um, a one-sided thing where you have the big companies and they have AI assistants or board members um, making big decisions about um, billions or whatever, but the same thing is also going to be decentralized and you will have it in your pockets. Yeah. So Presumably, there's a lot of uh, data processing that can, can, can run in, in, in the background. How, do, how does an AI uh, pass that information in the sense that, like, how does it help to make predictive judgments that are superior to human beings? Is that, is that about just sort of being able to process massive data sets? It has something to, with, to do with it. Um, it's all about pattern recognition, and this is harder than playing chess. 
How do I know that? In 1997, for the first time, the best human player, Kasparov, in chess was beaten by a machine. But back then, every kid was still much better at recognizing patterns like glasses or apples or faces and so on. Today, that's different. So in, it took until 2011 that, um, that for the first time we were able to achieve superhuman pattern recognition in certain limited domains. That was about traffic sign recognition in, uh, for self-driving cars. That was in 2011, and the first uh, author of that was Dan Girijan in my lab. Uh, since then, we have gained another factor of 10 in terms of computational power per euro, which means we can now do 10 times better and 10 times bigger uh, pattern recognition, and it's not going to stop there. So all of, um, of this pattern recognition thing, which always used to be easy for kids and, 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 and humans, is now uh, currently becoming easy for uh, machines as well. And this is um, uh, more driven by hardware advances than by software advances, because many of the basic principles go back to the previous millennium. So the basic algorithmic principles go back to the previous millennium, were invented back then, decades ago. They, they have been a couple of important refinements. However, uh, the one thing that is really um, unstoppable and, and seems to really give us a factor of 100 per decade, that is still these incredible advances in hardware. And that's not what we are doing. There, there we have to be thankful to the uh, guys who are building the computers and the market in video games, for example, which needs to be there to motivate the computer builders to build faster uh, chips and um, graphic uh, processing units and so on. So a single person couldn't do that. You need a whole civilization to create a market for that and to build faster and faster machines that allow you then to get human competitive or even superhuman patent recognizers, which are then going to invade every single business. So uh, increasingly, we're kind of seeing AI being kind of applied in, in pretty much every area of technology. Um, Effectively, do you think that all the big, you know, the, the, the names that we all know, all the big sort of technology companies, are they all effectively moving towards being AI companies rather than an e-commerce company or rather than a, a company that bases its services on search? Can we define them in that way? Do you think we're sort of like shifting, um, they're shifting the ground in which they, they really operate? Yeah, I think so. So the world's most valuable companies are certainly going into that direction. Oh, I have to be careful. The, the world's most valuable company, company is Saudi Aramco, which is about 10 times more valuable than the most valuable public company, at least, uh, probably more than that. However, the most valuable public Western companies, they are all using that. Apple, Google, um, uh, they are massively using... I'm happy to say even neural networks that we invented in, in our research labs in Munich here in this city, uh, long short-term memory, maybe you have heard that, uh, that's the stuff that is responsible for the speech recognition on your smartphone, and that's something that um, was developed in, in, um, in Munich here and then in Switzerland by my team, by my team and brilliant people like Sepp Hochreiter, Felix Geers, um, um, Alex Graves, who then later went to DeepMind, um, uh, Dan Wierstra, Justin Bayer, um, Faustino Gomez, Santi Fernandez, uh, all kinds of brilliant guys in my group who made it what it is today. Um, but nevertheless, um, there, there you have an example where the world's most valuable companies are using, um, or recently have discovered the, the, the commercial uh, usefulness of that stuff, which is now invading all of it. Huh? So Google is using LSTM, as it is called, not only for speech recognition, but also for translating one language into another one, from French to English, for example, or uh, for automatic email answering. I don't know whether anybody of you is using automatic email answering. That's also an LSTM which is powering that. Um, long short-term memory or um, all kinds of additional or image captioning where you have an image and then you get a, a text which says what do you see on that image. So all of that is an LSTM or at least part of that is an LSTM which is making that possible. And of course every single decade we are getting another factor of 100 which means, which means that um, <laughs> At the moment, a large LSTM network has maybe 1 billion connections, but in 10 years, it will have 100 billion. And then in 25 years, it will have 100,000 billion, and that's the number of connections in your brains. 
think about that. And it's not going to stop there. And that's what, uh, that's what also the Google CEO Sunday Pichar meant with we are going into an AI first world. Yeah, they've just replaced the head of search with uh, someone with specialism in, in AI, yeah. haven't they? Yeah. Because when you talk about mobile first, that's, that's the current state of art. Um, but when you look at the applications, they, they did everything almost everything that was necessary, cross-device, uh, very convenient design, usability. Um, but, but now we are entering a new stage where you said, OK, I have now the apps. It looks fine. It works through all devices. But now I want to do even less. I, I don't want to type in that all anymore. <laughs> I don't want to download a 1,000 apps for every single solution. Yeah. No, do the, do the rest in the cloud. I just want to talk to one guy. So everything's going to be happening in, effectively in the background. Yeah. And yeah. the best is even that thing knows already what I did not even express yet. But because he knows on my behavior patterns that this you might use. In financial, it's, it's, it's for example, um, imagine the, the, the assistant will get, OK, my wife is pregnant. Um, he will come up, hey, by the way, your car, your, your smart, that, that's not going to be big enough for that. <laughs> so he will come up with a solution immediately and says, well, I put you that amount of money beside. We'll give you a loan at the end. Um, put you that on a package that's optimized with low, lowest interest rates as possible. Uh, and then I can also buy you the car immediately then uh, a month before uh, giving birth. So you have everything in place there. That's something extremely convenient um, that, that can revolutionize finances. And you can see that many banks are very open to that. Uh, sure. Uh, I think Jürgen said that there are even some banks that they use uh, neural networks without even saying that uh, yet. That is definitely true, and they have been doing so since the 90s. So it's not a new thing to use neural networks to predict stock markets and stuff. Sure. It has been done in the 90s, and billions of dollars per day at, during certain times have been traded yeah. based on neural network predictions in the 90s. It's just that today we um, have deeper and more powerful uh, networks, and they are better than the old ones in, predict in finding certain patterns. And it's all about pattern detection. Sure. So, mm. But do you think at some point, if, 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 a, if a bot assistant is saying to you, hey, your, your, your wife's pregnant, you're going to need to get a new car. There will be sort of some degree of, maybe not that example is the best one, but um, there'll be some degree of resistance from consumers who will find that the ease is one thing, but there's also a level of creepiness about the machines knowing that this about it's like. I think, uh, first of all, I have to say, like not from a banking background, from an e-commerce background. Yeah. If, you, if you take a look at what Apple, Amazon is doing right now, it's like based on statistics. So there is no real intelligence in the system, I have to say. This is the recommendation. So, yeah, I, I think I have to push everything. Yeah. So uh, maybe I have a Nespresso machine. I buy a, a certain uh, amount of Nespresso capsules every month. Yeah. So, so far, nobody offered me, like, okay, there is a smart algorithm that knows my... my this is very simple compared to what you have talked about. But nobody's doing this, actually. So everything I have to do is push, remind myself, go to a website, type in my credit card detail. So I think um, the expectation what AI is possible of and the reality from a customer perspective is there is a bit of difference. So maybe uh, there is a bot um, buying a car for me, but I would be happy if someone would predict something or uh, that something goes out of my mind so that I don't have to remind myself or my wife don't have to remind myself of buying something that I need. Um, yeah. But so far reality is based on statistics and I think Amazon is like the most um, aggressive company in this regard but um, I don't see the Amazon newsletter is something very simple yeah, that's so a, far. That's also a big problem when we, we are looking for corporations and I think that many other providers in banking are doing that but machine learning is becoming a buzzword. And many companies that put that label on their front, um, you have no idea how intelligent that system really is. They say artificial intelligence and machine learning, but is it uh, scratching on the surface, or is that actual machine learning what okay. we think? And we talked about that uh, before, that there's not even a real definition that you can say, no, you're not right. You can say he's in a gray area still, so he's not, he's not wrong. But um, it's not what you normally expect as a as a partner or as a customer when you hear, hear about artificial intelligence. OK. Um, we're pretty much out of time, but what I would like to do is to finish off. If you could all very quickly just give everyone here a sense of what is finance going to look like in, in five or 10 years? How will consumers interact, and how will institutions uh, be investing? Um, just give us a kind of, a, a kind of like your key thoughts. Maybe, Jürgen, if you can just uh, start us off. So five years, that is really near-term future, yeah. and you will see many applications in hedge funds and in portfolio management where um, 
people won't lose their jobs, but just use these uh, tools in a way that makes them more competitive compared to the other guys who are working in the same field. And then um, probably we will see the beginnings of the emergence of bots that can do many things, not just um, where you don't have to have 100 different apps for doing all kinds of things, but where you have a rather smart um, smartphone which understands more or less what you want and then comes up with good suggestions and talks back to you in a way that makes sense, which is not as annoying as today often uh, is still the case and so on. And so these little guys are going to take uh, over some of your financial business, okay. but it's not going to be super revolutionary. Okay. In the long run, it's a totally different story. From a payment perspective, I think we will see um, um, the, the, the loss of physical secure elements, so there will be no cards anymore. Yep. So this kind of, of, of uh, thing that you go in the store and, and, and hand over your credit card, and uh, this will be over. You will be identified by biometric methods when you walk into the store and do the payment by uh, back-end processes. And this is, I think, what will be happening in the next five years. Alex. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, what we see in the market that we will have during the next years a lot more hybrid solutions that fintech companies uh, with modern chatbots and artificial intelligence working together with established banks um, to support the employees in banks. Um, in the long run, maybe in 10, 15, or 20 years, um, you will have a complete different market where maybe even banks don't exist in a way that we have it at the moment anymore, but not in the next five years yet. Great. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, hopefully, we won't all be replaced by, uh, by bots and AIs in the next 10 <laughs> or 15 years. Thank you for your time and thank you for your thank insights. You. Thank you.